In the Republican Party, we still believe that bravery is a virtue. These are two great examples, and I hope that they've been able to inspire us to be brave as well. I'm going to give you a definition for a word, and it's your job to tell me what word I've defined. Now, some of you know this trick, and if you know this trick, don't ruin it for everybody else, because I already did this the other day. The definition is an administered, you got to pay attention, it's a lot of big, big words, an administered political economy in which shares are adjusted so that citizens are made equal. It's communism, I hear communism, I'm going to do like the auctioneer, communism, com communism, communism, anybody got it? Got it? Got it? communism 50, communism 50, what else you got, communism, socialism, anything else, Marxism. Good guess is all. Incorrect. Equity. Equity. That's the definition for equity. For the last several years, that's what we've been implementing in all of our states. I know it's been a thing here in Idaho. And so now you know what we're actually implementing. They changed the words. We're getting used to this now. Conservatives have been going around five, six years talking to people about these issues. Finally, conservatives are starting to catch on that what the left does is changes the words. They change the words right off front. You say, no, we're going to have equity. And everybody says, oh, yeah, equity. That sounds good. That's like better equality. Okay. No, it's not. It's socialism. You just heard the definition. You guessed it yourselves. It's socialism. So when you look at your schools, you look at your universities, they have their diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. They're indoctrinating the kids with the concept of achieving equity and being inclusive. These new values that they're going to force upon us, Dylan Mulvaney's forcing equity and inclusion upon us, apparently. Now you know what they're forcing upon us. And I didn't tell you. You knew it yourselves once you heard what the words mean in the actual words that they use. So this is what's going on in this country. I don't want to be the first one to break it to you if you haven't caught on, but I think, you're, I think you already know. I think you already know the truth, just like you knew... When I read the definition, said the definition of equity, you knew what I was talking about, that this is socialism or Marxism or communism. The truth of the, of the matter is, what Kyle experienced a couple of years ago, and what we've experienced every bit since before 2020, but especially 2020 in this country, is a cultural revolution. A Marxist cultural revolution brought to the United States of America. Kyle, unfortunately, faced the violent street part. The Red Guard taking to the street, tearing down the old society, tearing down statues, tearing down our cities, threatening people with physical violence to the point where we had to use our Second Amendment to defend ourselves. That's the violent part that happened in China. It happened in China in the 1950s, happened in China again in the 1960s. It was a cultural revolution and it was led by the youth. The youth are the ones that they're using to overthrow our country. And that's why I get invited time and time again. This is my fourth trip to Idaho. Thank you for having me again. I keep getting invited out to speak about education. This is why education matters so much. So we got this thing, equity, taking over our education, these new values, inclusion, sustainability, all this nonsense, a sustainable and inclusive future. But today is an important day, and we're here for a Lincoln Day event. I don't know if you know the history, it is April 15th, and you're all thinking, oh, it's taxes, I hope I paid mine. <laughs> but a lot of people don't know that 162 years ago today is the day the Civil War was declared. We are standing here on the 162nd anniversary of the declaration of the Civil War. The shots were fired at Fort Sumner on April 12th, 1861, and Lincoln declared war on April 15, 1861. The war lasted, there's an old movie, I had to watch it in school back when we learned things, called Across Five Aprils. The war ended on April 9th, 1865. And in the span of this time, in the middle of this time, we had something very important introduced to the United States. We actually had three constitutional amendments added during the Civil War, the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And among those is the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment includes something called the Equal Protection Clause. It says that the states will not deny equal protection under the law to anybody within their jurisdictions. It is an Equal Protection Clause, not an Equitable Protection Clause. We do not have an Equitable Socialist Protection Clause in the United States of America. 
We have an equal protection clause. So we talk about the First Amendment, it's very important. We talk about the Second Amendment. Here we're talking about the Fourteenth Amendment. Every American is entitled and protected by our Constitution to have equal treatment before the law. This is impossible, let me tell you, under equity. It is impossible under equity. We can, we can make this very easy. We can turn to Ibram Kendi. We, Ibram Kendi, you've all heard of this guy, right? He's, he's this guy that they put on TV to talk about racism who can't define racism without talking in a circle. What's racism, Dr. Kendi, the world's leading expert, critical race theorist, expert on racism? Racism is when racist people do racist things. <laughs> it's basically the definition he gives. And I, I watched him on TV do this, and people made fun of him, and they're like, oh my god, that's so stupid. And I, because I actually bothered to read his books, realized that that's actually the definition he gives at the start of the first page, chapter one, of how to be an anti-racist. He actually put it in writing with an editor, etc. He's not a smart man. But what he says on page 19, also in that first chapter, is he says that if we're going to achieve equity, he says the only remedy, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. He tells you explicitly at the beginning of the most heavily pushed book on anti-racism, race Marxism, in this country, he tells you right at the very beginning of that book that the way that they're going to achieve racial equity is through intentional state discrimination that violates the 14th Amendment, Equal Protection Clause, unambiguously. And this is what they're teaching our children because they have to get our children to not understand what our country was built upon so that they can force this upon us and transform our country into a socialist shithole. Now I have your attention now, don't I? <laughs> I got told yesterday I got invited here because I just say what it is. And that's what this is. So I'm going to talk a minute about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We already covered equity. Equity is the goal. Socialism is the goal. And as Lenin said, socialism is just a step on the way to communism. So that's the goal. That's what they're trying to get us to do. But how are they going to do it? they got this diversity and inclusion. We like those things, right? Diversity and inclusion. Those are great things. Communists change the words on you folks. We should know this by now. Diversity seems not to mean diversity. You guys all know the story about Larry Elder. Larry Elder ran for governor of California. I don't know if you know who Larry Elder is. It turns out he's a black man. And what did the Los Angeles Times, we're not talking about some rinky-dink like the L.A. Blade or something like this. The, what did the Los Angeles Times put as a headline? Larry Elder, black face of white supremacy. <laughs> Kyle Rittenhouse defends himself and his life in the president of the United States campaigns and says he's a white, white supremacist. <laughs> Critical race theory and their idea of diversity means calling everything you want to control racist until you control it. The only people who are diverse, because Larry Elder is not diverse, Dave Chappelle is not diverse, you don't know if you know who Dave Chappelle is. Dave Chappelle is a comedian, he's also black. He also used to have a TV show called The Chappelle Show, I know some of you are too young to know what this is, where he had the joke about the blind black man who was a white supremacist because he didn't know he's black. <laughs> This was a running gag Dave Chappelle did. It was funny. We, we used to be able to laugh at things. And so what happens? Dave Chappelle gets up and he makes these jokes in his special last year about trans, about the trans issue. He's called, calling it the alphabet mafia or whatever he's calling it, the alphabet people. <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys know a lot about the trans people. They get pissed about everything. They got pissed about this. So they wrote an article and they said, Dave Chappelle told jokes about trans people from his position of white privilege. <laughs> That's what they said. Why did they say that? Because they call everything they want to control racist until they control it. They don't have that many tools. But we've caught on to this. But diversity means that you understand that this is how we're supposed to reorganize the country. It doesn't mean what you look like. It doesn't mean if you're Hispanic or black. It doesn't mean if you're Asian or whatever the A-A-N-H-P-I. They love acronyms that don't describe any people. It doesn't matter if you're LGBTQ or the plus or the I or the A or the hot dog emoji. <laughs> it doesn't matter which one you are. You have to think like an equity-based socialist. 
That's what Ibram Kendi says. He says we're going to appoint experts in diversity. Now I know we have some folks here that were in the Soviet Union, so they know what these people are called, these political officers that are experts in the socialist doctrine. They're called commissars. This is where we are in America today, ladies and gentlemen. We are installing commissars under the brand name diversity so that they can bring in socialism under the brand name equity. And then they have this concept of inclusion. Don't we want to be inclusive? We don't want anybody to feel like they're not included, right? We have to include everybody. We have to include, you know, violent criminals. We have to include lunatics. We have to include the mentally ill and put them in the classroom under inclusive policies. We have to include, 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 except not Dave Chappelle and not Larry Elder, not Kyle Rittenhouse, not me. I got kicked off Twitter for four months for saying, okay, groomer. <laughs> <laughs> But at the University of Wisconsin, I think they took the cake in Madison. Beautiful campus. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's gorgeous. They have this rock on campus, 42 ton boulder. It's called Chamberlain Rock. It's named after a geologist. I know this is a gem state. I know geology is a big deal here. They have this rock. And it turns out that that rock had an inappropriate name back in the 1920s. That type of glacial deposit was called a bad word, a racial slur. Somebody dug this up, found out this fact, and all of a sudden this rock, this beloved, you know, campus rock, hey, let's meet by the rock, hey, let's, you know, get together and go out and have a party after we go to the rock or whatever, was discovered to be not inclusive. So the university paid $60,000 to move the rock off campus to make the campus more inclusive, and then patted themselves on the back in the media for months. So what does this look like? If you can't have a rock on campus because it might make somebody think the wrong thoughts about a bad word, or you can't have somebody who tells the wrong kind of joke, or you can't have somebody who said something on social media that was, you know, maybe 12 years ago that made somebody upset when they found it way later. You think of like some of these Democratic politicians, they dug up all these things, Al Franken, they got rid of him because he said he had a picture with a Playboy girl or something a long time ago. What do you call it? Purges. Censorship. So we have DEI is supposed to be inclusive, diverse, equitable. It all sounds so good, and this is what we're installing. It's what we're teaching our kids. And what it means is achieving socialism by installing commissars and purging and censoring any disagreement. This is what we've got to fight in this country. And now Florida, everybody looks at Ron DeSantis and they say, oh yeah, Ron DeSantis is fighting it. So Ron DeSantis is Senate just wrote to get, I know it's how you know, the legislature's work, it's not technically his Senate, but they just wrote this bill to get rid of DEI offices at all the campuses in Florida. And they put on the media and they had their big, big show on TV and they had to pull back the bill and rewrite the bill. The new bill doesn't mention diversity, equity, inclusion offices at the universities at all because the federal government stepped in and said, we'll take away all your money. And the accrediting body said, we'll de-accredit every university in Florida if you get rid of the DEI offices. Is this how a free country works? Is this how a country where the Florida, the universities in Florida can decide for themselves what Florida values are going to base their universities on? No. This is communist stuff. Because we're going through a communist revolution. Now, this inclusion, inclusion thing really ties back to an idea. I've been studying Mao Zedong and the Chinese Cultural Revolution for most of the year. It turns out that what we're seeing is it's not just the street stuff, it's the same program Mao laid out. Mao laid out a formula, he bragged about it in the speech he gave in 1957. He gave this formula, he said, I came up in 1942 with the formula by which I was going to transform our country. It's called unity, criticism, unity. He bragged about it. Unity, criticism, unity. So we're going to start, he says, by creating a desire for unity. See, the language today is we just want to create a place where everybody feels like they belong. We're going to have a place where there's unity. We're going to have a country with unity. Everybody's going to feel like they belong. It's going to be an inclusive space. And how are we going to make sure it's that way? Well, if you're a white supremacist, according to the definitions they make up on the spot, meaning you said something they don't like, you don't want unity. You want white supremacy. That makes some people feel, feel uncomfortable. And that they're not included. That they're not welcome. You're the problem. You are the problem. You need to change. You need to have more inclusive values. We're going to have unity in this country. We're going to have unity in this campus. We're going to have unity in this school. And you are the person who has the wrong values that you need to change. 
And so we've got a training session, a DEI training at work. We've got a social emotional learning lesson at school. And we're gonna teach you these new values. And what we're gonna do, in the words of Robin DiAngelo, who was another one of these critical race theorists that was pushed into the limelight massively in 2020 following the death of George Floyd. According to her, it's a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process of self-reflection, self-criticism, and social activism. That's what you actually are signing up for. So you have to sign up for a process of what they called in China, Pipon Dojang, critical struggle, so that we can have unity. You see, you have to want to have unity, Mao said, according to this new standard. And on the far side of it, we're going to have unity according to a new standard, is what he said. We're going to make a desire for unity. We're going to blame everybody. We're going to blame every single person who doesn't participate in this correctly for their own failures, for their participation in white supremacy and their participation in transphobia or whatever else. You are the problem, and you're going to sign up to these trainings. You're going to criticize yourself. People are going to criticize you until you get the hang of it. Everybody's going to have to confess, hey, have you ever had a DEI training work? What do they say? Hey. There's a big problem with racism. It's very covert. It's systemic. A lot of us don't think that we're racist, but we participate in racism. Let's go ahead and have everybody volunteer something racist that they did. And somebody raises their hand and says something. And then everybody else has to raise their hand and say, oh, yeah, yeah I, did this too. I did this stuff too. And then the workplace is completely whacked out. Everybody hates each other. Everybody's in a hostile working environment. Now imagine that you're seven years old and this is happening and you're a child. See, so what Mao did with his bullying about the criticism that you're the problem, you don't want to get on board with the new socialist society, you don't want to have unity under socialist discipline, he called it. What Mao said, or what Mao did, was he created an identity politics system in order to force, especially young people, to want to become activists to transform the society according to this model. These people were called the Red Guard. They were violent. They destroyed property. Their goal was to destroy what they were called the suju, the four olds, the four olds of Chinese society, old culture, old customs, old habits, and old ways of thinking. They challenged their parents. They threw their parents under the bus. And the way Mao did this was through identity politics, just like we have today. It was just different identities. Mao came out and said, we're going to separate the population into 10 identity categories. Five of them are black, that's bad. Five of them are red, that's good. That's communist, that's good. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat people differently based on which identity category they're in. So if you were a, a rich farmer, or you were a landlord, or you were a counter-revolutionary, you fought against his revolution, or you were a bad influence, AKA domestic extremist in today's parlance, or you were just a right winger, those are your five bad categories. Those are the five bad identities. Of course, we have white supremacists, domestic extremists, et cetera, et cetera, today. Transphobe, we've got all these black identity categories. And what he said was, look, if you have a black identity, your children have a black identity by virtue of being related to you. If your grandparents, your great-grandparents, happen to own a lot of land and were rich, guess what, kid, you're seven years old, you're in the black category. We're gonna treat you bad. You don't get to have special treatment at school. You don't get to wear the red scarf. You don't get to have special treats. We're gonna bully you. We're gonna tell you, we're gonna get you to do the most important thing in Chinese culture that you should never do. We're gonna get you to denounce your father in front of us. And if you do, you can join the red categories. You could become a laborer or a peasant or a revolutionary cadre, which is a diversity officer. That was their word for commissar. You can become a revolutionary guard or you can become a revolutionary martyr. You can die for the cause, and then your family will get the honor of having red identity and better treatment. So what do we do today in our schools? We tell these kids, you're born in a body with white skin, maybe, if you happen to be white, maybe you're Mexican, so you're white adjacent. They call it white Mexican. <laughs> you might think I'm making that up. White Mexican. Whatever. You're born in a body with a skin color that associates you with the evils of slavery, Jim Crow, etc. A systemic oppression, your white supremacy runs through your veins. You're seven years old, you can't do anything about it. We're going to teach you about all of these horrible things. We're going to give you another book about slavery, another book about slavery, another book about slavery. We're going to keep talking about it. We're going to talk about starvation. We're going to talk about all these really negative subjects and social emotional learning. We're going to help you deal with the emotional impact. Because remember, you're seven. 
We're talking about starvation and slavery and mistreatment and all this. And you're going to get seven-year-olds, just like we've seen across the country, come home and say, I'm the worst kind of person because of my skin color. And then they're going to hold out an opportunity for them. Well, you can become an activist, you can become an ally, but guess what? All the queer identities, all those gender non-conforming, Dylan Mulvaney, all that stuff, those are good identities. We're going to celebrate you. We're going to affirm you. We're going to bring you to a club after school, the GSA. It used to be called Gay Straight Alliance. Now it's the Gender Sexuality Alliance. There's barely any gay people in it anymore because they have to be radically queer and trans. They're actually literally doing a kind of conversion therapy on autistic kids who think that they're gay and turning them trans. Through rampant social affirmation, and by the way, don't tell your parents. Okay, groomer. So they set up bad identity categories, pressure the kids, make them feel terrible about their racial identity, and give them the queer identities to transition to. Why? And they show them Dylan Mulvaney all over the place. You know what the, mo you know what the most desired job that young people in America today say that they want is? Is it astronaut? No. Petroleum executive? No. That was a joke. Nobody wants to grow up here. <laughs> Influencer. It is social media influencer. And so why is Dylan Mulvaney, a 28-year-old man who looks like a man, sort of, <laughs> dancing around, claiming he's a prepubescent girl, acting the fool, getting massive contracts, getting TikTok videos going viral to the millions upon millions. Why? Because he's showing a generation of children just like he says on his channel that if you grow up and get facial surgery, you can be an influencer like me. An influencer is the main thing they want to be. And the school is going to affirm them and back them up. Why do you think these books with the pornography are in the library? So they're going to see this stuff and go ask the teacher, who's then going to start them on a path of affirmation. The adult in the room at the school acting in loco parentis who used to say, hey, no. Let's talk to your parents and get this squared away, is now saying, hey, yes. We're going to socially affirm you. Oh, your parents don't want to socially affirm you? Look at the states that are already doing this. Washington just passed it this week. California already did it. Vermont has one that's worse. So we've got three states. You think it's not coming to Idaho? Three states now where the state can take your child away for not affirming their gender transition. You as the parent are the one who's wrong. All they have to do is denounce you at school, and CPS will step in, and you're the child abuser because you refuse to affirm your child. In Canada, it is now being criminalized to try to talk your child out of gender transition if they announce that they want to have that. Why are they doing this? Well, they know that if they can pull children into the situation where they're broken, that they're not going to be able to form categories correctly. They're not going to be able to understand themselves correctly. And most importantly, they're going to get in opposition to you as their parents. They're going to get in opposition to their faith. You try to raise your kids as Christian, every parent who's ever done that knows the challenge. And here they're giving them something that's in direct odds to what the Bible says so that when the child gets all worked up and angry about it, it's super important to their sense of who they are. They're going to say the Bible's wrong. I'm done with that. And what are you going to say? Because CPS is waiting. I don't know if you call it Child Protective Services here in Idaho, but you don't, you don't want to lose your kid. So you're get, you get put in a bad position. That's why they're doing this. That's why they're doing this. They're doing this so that when the riot breaks out that Kyle found himself in, half of the country celebrates it. Kamala Harris goes on TV running for vice president at the time, encouraging people to bail him out of jail. And the public's cheering. That's what they need. They need the young people cheering for this. You see it right now with this shooting, the just tragic shooting that just happened from a trans individual at a, uh, a Christian school in Nashville, Tennessee, which is not that far from where I live. This person, this woman, who's in the midst of being loaded up on God knows what chemicals, estrad estradiol upregulates violence, flips out, goes in, shoots three teachers and three nine-year-olds. Of course, this person's now the real victim. And we have marches happening throughout the streets, marches of young people, and we have that lunatic from Harvard, David Hogg, who got famous pretending to have been involved in a school shooting at Parkland back in a, a number of years ago. He wasn't even in there. He wasn't there. 
We have him on TV saying the youth are going to change this country. And you know who he sounds exactly like? Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab wrote a book last year called The Great Narrative for a Better Future. The Great Reset, book two. See, there's two whole books he wrote about the Great Reset, which is a conspiracy theory, of course. And what does he say? He says, we got a three-part plan to transform the world. Part one, we have this ESG score. We're going to give corporations big scores, big numbers, and they're going to make them, if they want to have financial capital behind their business or whatever, they were going to have their board be the way that it's going to be able to, we're going to finance it. If they want to be able to be wrapped up in the index funds where all the pension money goes so that their stock is actually worth something, they're going to have to do all this. But he says, well, some of them won't do it. Some of them don't want to have a government, business, public, private partnership, fascist arrangement, and they'll resist. He says, so what we're going to do is we're going to transform the youth. We're going to make it so that youth won't participate in their companies if they're not sustainable and inclusive. They won't buy from them. They won't work for them. They won't work for anybody right now. And he says we're going to just, if we can't get it from the supply, we're going to get it from the demand. We're going to make the youth reject every company that doesn't take up the new initiative. So in a recent speech he said, so what's this for? Part three was we're also going to rewrite the social contract, the agreement of our societies that we all kind of follow whether it's rule of law, whether it's individual liberty, whatever this social contract is, we're going to rewrite it. He says, we're going to move away, lest I have to prove to you that this is communism. We're going to move away from a culture, or sorry, an economy. He says, we're going to move away from an economy based on production and consumption. We're going to move into an economy based on caring and sharing. I kid you not. One of the most important business people in the world sitting in a chair talking in a serious fashion to a camera saying we're going to have an economy based on caring and sharing. And all the young people are saying, hell yeah, because they've been brainwashed. Because they've had not whitewashed education like the critical race theorist told us, but red redwashed education. I can prove we've had redwashed education because not one of you, or maybe one of you, maybe about 10 of you in this room, I bet. How many of you have heard of Trofim Lysenko? Yep, like 10. How many of you have heard of the killing fields? Oh yeah, we got a lot more, okay, good. Good, that was Cambodia, that was three million dead. That was bad, that was for communism. The Great Leap Forward, heard of the Great Leap Forward? Okay, we got a few, we're doing better. That was where Mao Zedong implemented a program that ended up with 55 million dead Chinese people in a destroyed Chinese economy and massive famines. Trofim Lysenko, by the way, was a Soviet agriculturalist who ended up probably being directly responsible for the deaths of 100 million people, starvation. Turns out he, had, he believed that you could teach the plants communist theory and they would grow better. He said, give me a left time and I can teach oranges to grow in Siberia. He said that you can get plants of the same kind and give them comradely feelings by giving them communist doctrine and talking to the seeds and then you can plant them too close together, too little water, no fertilizer, because they would share and help work together. And if anybody defied this guy, they put him in the gulag. They put him in prison, they shot him. Millions starved. How many of you have heard of the Holodomor? Way less than half. How many of you know who Walter Durante is? Famous line, you gotta break a few eggs to make an omelet. That's Walter Durante. He was a New York Times reporter who was working with Stalin in Moscow. And when the Holodomor story started to break, thanks to a British journalist called Gareth Jones, you can watch a movie called Mr. Jones about it. I highly recommend you see this. Walter Durante published in the New York Times the headline, Ukrainians hungry, not starving. He won the Pulitzer Prize for that. Turns out three and a half million Ukrainians were starving. They were eating their children. It wasn't good. These are the things though that every American should know. Every country that wishes to maintain itself must know the true history of communism and its atrocities. And a handful of you, some of you, Killing Fields did great, but most of, the, most of these points, these are huge, huge things people have never heard of in this country. We have no education, so you guys want solutions. Here's a solution. We know it's a big deal, I can tell you how. Why don't you guys pass a bill mandating the education of true, the true history of communism and its atrocities in Idaho schools. hesitate to do it with the Nazis or the fascists, and good. Why aren't we teaching about the communists and their atrocities? It should be in every school in Idaho. It should be every school in America. Now here's how you know it's a big deal. They tried to pass this in Virginia. It's the only state that's tried to do it so far. 
They tried to pass it in Virginia. The Virginia Democrats went bonkers, voted 100% against it, and then put out a huge press run claiming that it would be racist against Asian people to teach the history of communism. Because Mao, you know, Pol Pot, it might cause anti-Asian sentiment if we taught the history of communism in the state of Virginia. So what you know is it triggered them. Wouldn't you want to know which members of your legislature are against this idea? Yeah, we do. Aren't we hunting rhinos? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't you like to know if your governor would veto that? I don't know how much you, you like Brad Little, but it seems like that's the kind of thing you want to know if he's going to veto. Maybe he doesn't. Good for him. Maybe he does. Now we got some questions on the table, don't we? These are the kinds of things, if we want to talk about some solutions, that you've got to start thinking about. The left thinks operationally, and the right does not. The right thinks reactively. We like to think that they're stupid. Well, they are kind of. They don't know what a woman is. <laughs> but they're not unstrategic. They are extremely elaborate with their strategies. They know exactly how far to push the issue so that you end up with large, large amounts of litigation about whether or not self-defense occurred. This is called mid-level violence. It's a well well-trodden strategy that they use. They think operationally. You need to start thinking operationally. How do you think operationally? And this is for the legislators primarily in the room, the people that work with them. How do you think operationally? Well, you think of these things like, maybe we should start teaching kids about communism. Who would be against that? Well, we want to find out who would be against that. So we're going to provoke them and see who's going to stand up and try to fight it. Who's going to be against this mutilation of children? Let's find out who's against that. So put the bill out. Put the push out. Who's going to be against the idea of getting rid of porn for lab in libraries for children? Find out who's against it. It's our name and names. Hold them to account. Because for too long we've had too many politicians who are making deals, whether they're just corrupt business deals, whether it's through the World Economic Forum with Klaus Schwab or the United Nations, or directly with the CCP, which is our greatest enemy in this country. There's too many politicians making too many deals and we've got to start figuring out who they are and we've got to get them out of office. They're selling this country and these states out and it's unacceptable. Now I'm going to talk, I only got a couple minutes left, I actually went over, people are going to start having a cow. I got warned. I want to talk though about what normal people can do because you're not all legislators. You can pressure your legislators, you come up with one of these great brainchilds about like, let's teach about communism, tell them. That's great. But normal people, people ask me all the time, James, what can I do? And I'm like, I don't know you. What can you do? Somebody can bake. <laughs> Apparently, people will drop thousands of dollars for your baked goods. <laughs> That's something you can do. I'm not joking. That's very serious. You can bake and help raise money for people that are doing the right things. You can open up your, your living room to your grandkids or to your children and say, bring your friends over. Let's start having some real talk every other Thursday evening, a couple times a month. Let's sit down and talk. You can organize some stuff where you're starting to interact with the youth. Hey, maybe, you know, it's, the guns are a big deal here. Maybe you guys start creating youth shooting clubs and start figuring that out. Get together, teach them the value of the Second Amendment, teach them how to handle a firearm, teach them how to be an adult. Teach them some values along the way. Go grab some snacks afterwards. Take them to that ice cream potato place. <laughs> I had it. It's good. <laughs> Teach them what it means to be an Idahoan. Eat the ice cream potato. Eat another one. Make them eat it like Happy Gilmore until they cry, whatever it is. You guys have a million things you can do. I want to tell you real quick about one thing from my, my past and one thing from a friend of mine. Something, just to give you an idea of what you can do. How anybody can start to do stuff. Anybody can decide that they're going to be willing to maybe stand up and speak or bake some goods or whatever. Open your home to start talking and getting youth together. There are a million things people can do. We've got to stop thinking in the, oh, I don't know what to do. There's nothing I can do. There's so many things you can do. So for me, I obviously do all this nerdy stuff. I didn't stand up here and tell you about Herbert Marcuse and repressive tolerance. But there's this essay in 1965. He writes, it's called Repressive Tolerance. He says, the country that we live in is very tolerant, but the problem is it's repressive tolerance. It's only tolerant so far. It won't tolerate, you know, overthrowing the system. It doesn't tolerate leftist radicals. So we're going to create a new system, he said, called liberating tolerance, where we're going to tolerate movements from the left and not tolerate movements from the right. That's literally what he says. That's the actual thesis statement of this essay. So I read this thing, and I'm like, holy crap, this is the roadmap for our country right now. I start trying to tell people, hey, go read Repressive Tolerance if you want to understand what's going on. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. 
When go read for press, it's all, it take you an hour and a half to read it. It's not that long. It's a roadmap for the country we live in. It even says that we can use, the left can use violence and the right, of course, is not allowed to use violence. We have the living embodiment of that doctrine sitting here in this room. Nobody would read it. So what did I do? I said, you know what, I'm just going to read it to you. So I started a podcast where I started to read communist literature to people. I get hundreds of thousands of listens to my podcast every week. All I do is read their books to you because you won't read it for yourself. Guess what? You can read it for yourself. There's something you can do. You can start educating other people. What does the communist literature say? You can get people together. Or on the other hand, maybe you can't read communist literature. It's hard. You know what you can read? The Bill of Rights. Come on. You can read the Declaration of Independence. You can read the Constitution. You can read the Federalist Papers. You can read the Anti-Federalist Papers. You can get a group of people together every Thursday night or Tuesday night or whatever night you do things that are the most fun in Idaho. And you can read the founding documents of this country. You can read the state constitution of Idaho. You can know what your rights are in a way that you probably not ever really engage. This is how the national organization called Moms for Liberty started. It's now 135,000 women across this country, moms across this country, taking this country back from the grassroots up, one of the most effective organizations in the country. It started with eight women who wanted to get together and read the Declaration of Independence together. You can do that. I don't know if you guys have seen my friend Billboard Chris. Chris Elston, he's a Canadian guy. Yeah, he's great, he's absolutely great. I saw a video of him today on a college campus. He went to the University of Florida, I think, and he's talking and this kid comes up to him and he's like, you're all wrong. Ron DeSantis is like a demon or something like that, he's Satan. He's saying this like literally crazy leftist stuff and Chris just very calmly, maybe that's your temperament, talks to this guy. Yeah, well, what about this? Well, let's talk about this. And he just talks to him for about 15 minutes. The end of the thing, the kid's like, I agree with almost everything you say now. I didn't understand. He started off saying crazy leftist stuff. So what Chris did, what Chris got started with, is he saw that somebody put up a billboard in England that said, I stand with J.K. Rowling, something to that effect, with the whole trans thing. And they took the billboard down and said it was hate speech. So Chris fronted some of his own money, a few hundred bucks, put up a billboard in Vancouver, said, I stand with J.K. Rowling, or whatever the exact same wording was. Maybe it was, I heart J.K., something really simple. They took it down as hate speech the next day. He parlayed that. He had a website set up, got a bunch of donations, put up eight more billboards. They all came down, all across North America. Hate speech. Stand with J.K. Rowling, the most beloved children's author, successful children's author of our time. So he said, you know what? They can take my billboards down off of the sign, but they can't take the billboard off of my, sh my shirt. So he made a sign made and says something like, children can't consent to puberty blockers. That's all it says. Puts a sign on with a rope and goes and stands street corners. He doesn't pick fights, he goes to college campuses, he just stands there and anybody who comes up and talks to him, he talks to him. He gets his facts straight, he learned all about it. What are, how do puberty blockers work? What do they do to kids? What does it do to their bodies? What does their future look like? How is, how is affirmation good for them instead of, you know, whatever? He has the tagline that our children are called boys and girls and they're beautiful just as they are. This is how reasonable and smooth this guy is. They physically have attacked him. They broke his arm. They punch him in the face. They punch him in the throat. Only in Canada. No Americans have done that. Somebody spit on him. But Americans are actually, he said, much safer than Canadians. Guess what? You can create excuses to go have conversations with people too. You're not going to have those conversations on your couch. So if we're in a cultural revolution, that's what I want to bring up at this point. If we're in a cultural revolution, we better stop it. We had better stop it. And we are now past the point, I'm sorry to give you, I gave you a quiz at the beginning, I gave you responsibility now. I know we love responsibility on the right. Personal responsibility. You now know what's happening in this country. You have no excuse. And if you sleep one more night through the night without having a plan of something you're gonna to do tomorrow, you're my enemy. You need to get up every day thinking whether it's a small thing or a big thing, what your gift of the spirit is, and you need to bring it to bring this country back. What's going to save this country? I got asked this earlier tonight. What's going to save this country? Is people who have faith in this country and who are willing to sacrifice to bring this country back. I expect there are a lot of you in this room who are of that type. You have to start thinking about what you can do, and you must do it. There's no more sitting on the couch. There's no more hoping it'll blow over. There's no more hoping somebody like Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis or James Lindsay or Neil and Julie are going to save you. 
They made me go on radio at 7.30 in the morning the other day. Did you know that? 7.30 in the morning. I had COVID. These are nice people, allegedly. But seriously, they get people on their show. They're doing something. You've all got to figure out what you can do. Thank you for letting me come and talk 10 minutes over my time to tell you that we can save this country and it starts with you deciding to get up every day and to do something to save this country. Whether it's learn, whether it's talk, whether it's reach to young people, whether it's bake something good enough to eat that you can sell for $1,300 at a table. <laughs> Find out what you can do and start doing it and do it every day. It doesn't matter how small it is. A thousand small hands make light work. This is the only way we save this place. Grassroots up. Thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for letting me talk to you.